Well, thanks, Fabio, for introducing me. And thanks for those in the lecture hall for persisting until the very last talk of this workshop. For me, of course, it's a bit frustrating that I've got to talk to a screen instead of be, being able to talk in front of you in the lecture hall. But as uh, most of you will know, my laptop broke down last Monday and I had to rush back to Zurich to get a re replacement because I am going, I will be traveling for the next two weeks and I need a working laptop urgently. Well, at least I'm very grateful that I have the opportunity to give this presentation online. And on that occasion, I would also like to express my appreciation for the easy staff for their very competent handling of the online presentations all through the workshop. So I've added a case study to my title, to this uh, title, Frequency Explicit Shape Uncertainty Quantification, because I would like to address a very specific setting. So what is not intended in my presentation is generality. I would like to keep a very narrow focus for the sake of simplicity to convey the main ideas. And in this K explicit business, this focus is sometimes advisable because one has to dig into, well, rather technical formulas, estimates, and they are reasonably simple only in a reasonably simple setting. This is why I would like to call this a case study. I could also like, I could also call it a wrap up because my presentation is going to connect to several others that were given during this workshop. For instance, Laura's presentation, Carlos, then that of Feng Xiaobing, what we heard from Ivan this morning and also the talk given uh, by Davide. So you will hear about many things and considerations that have already been well addressed by other speakers, maybe from another perspective. So there's a strong repetition element in my presentation. Well, but for the final talk of a workshop, this may be appropriate. So I should also mention that I'm going to report about a small ongoing joint project with Christoph Schwab and also you and Spence. So, well, the setting is very familiar by now. It's frequency domain, acoustic scattering modeled by the variable coefficient Helmholtz equation. Here I confine myself to a variable index of refraction and moreover to piecewise constants indices of refraction. So this function n of x is piecewise constant, value one in an unbounded domain and a positive value different from one inside another domain D, which now stands for a homogeneous scattering object. K as usual is the wave number. And of course, this is the crucial frequency parameter. We study the interaction of uh, this scattering object with an incoming amplitude one plane wave. And what I'm interested in is to understand the impact of, say, variations of the shape of this scattering object on the scattered wave. Later, I'm going to put everything into a big ball and on its boundary, I'm going to assume, say, perfect absorbing boundary conditions. So then this will confine 
the scattering problem to a, a bounded domain. There's a large body of theory about this simple scattering problem. And in particular, we know existence and uniqueness of weak solution in H1 local. Now, what about these shape permutations of the scatterer? This is where the uncertainty quant shape uncertainty quantification comes into play. And I would like to motivate this by a picture that has already been shown, or a similar version of uh, which has already been shown by Laura. These are so-called nanospheres. So small nanometer size metallic objects uh, produced by engineers and meant to interact with light. Of course, light is electromagnetic radiation, but after some dimensional reduction, this can also be modeled by the Helmholtz equation. And now I've used the word nanosphere, but what you're seeing here are electron microscopic images of actual nanospheres. And maybe I should rather call them nanopotatoes because what you see that they deviate considerably from the ideal shape of a sphere. So they show large shape variation. And this is what I want to address. The scatterer does not have an ideal shape, but rather a shape subject to large perturbations. And this, well, more or less rules out using linearization approaches, as they have been discussed, for instance, in Carlos presentation. So I don't want to rely on linearization. I would like to tackle these large deformations, well, rigorously. So, and this is the plan of my presentation. So I would like to discuss large deformation deterministic shape uncertainty quantification. With deterministic, I mean that as has been well done by many other people presenting here, the stochastic aspect is, is eliminated by switching to a parametric formulation. And then I would like to pursue the search for polynomial surrogate models for the resulting high dimensional parametric model. We have seen this in many presentations. And key for the efficiency of polynomial surrogate models is an extremely smooth dependence of uh, the quantities of interest on the shape parameters. Well, this was, for instance, addressed also in Ivan's presentation this morning. And this smooth dependence is mathematically captured by the notion of shape holomorphy. In some earlier work, several years ago, also together with Laura Christoph and Claudia Schillings. We already discussed this. At that time, for very low frequencies, essentially for an elliptic setting, which is appropriate for many nano-optics applications. The new aspect today is that I would like to allow higher frequencies. And in particular, I would like to understand 
how the various constants uh, depend on k. And the goal is, of course, to make this dependence as explicit as possible. And this is important because, again, I would like to refer to Ivan's presentation, who uh, stressed the well destructive impact of what is known as a quasi resonance. So let's look at the solution operator for a scattering problem. Well, here it's with some right hand side. Could also call this a resolvent operator. And from PDE theory, it's known. And this was also, say, for instance, addressed by Davide that this is going to be a meromorphic operator valued function in the frequency uh, parameter k. And well, analytic Freytholm theory tells us that it will have a number of isolated poles in the negative imaginary half plane. And now they are so-called trapping settings. You have also seen this. So for impenetrable objects, such near cavity shapes. And this morning, Ivan showed us the same picture taken from a, a paper by Ewan and Andrea about whispering gallery modes. So they are typical of trapping settings. And in such trapping settings, the resolvent operator has poles that more or less rapidly approach the real axis as you increase the frequency. And each of these poles is then connected to a quasi mode. And when the poles get very close to the real axis, you have a near resonance. So you have a near blow up of the solution. And now why is this relevant for shape uncertainty quantification in the context of scattering problems? Let's look at a very simple one parameter case. And that one stochastic parameter is just a scaling parameter. So there's only one degree of freedom. And this is the size of the scatterer. Its shape, it's not touched. And now all of you know that modulo pullback, one can realize the solution in a rescaled setting by solving the problem in the original setting with a rescaled wave number. And now you see that the K dependence of the solution, well, can just be swapped for the Y dependence. And so the near resonances now become highly relevant for the Y dependence. Look at this cartoon. Let's assume we are interested in a well scalar quantity of interest, depending on the solution. And now when you have a trapping setting with poles rapidly, so even geometrically approaching the real axis, then at certain so-called near resonant frequencies, you will encounter a blow up of the solution. And usually this translates into a blow up of the quantity of interest. And so you get such a wide dependence with extremely sharp spikes. And now, of course, you can imagine when your frequency sits right on a spike, this, well, essentially defeats uncertainty quantification because a tiny variation of Y will lead to a huge variation of the output. So this is 
the the awkward setting where uncertainty quantification is well in a frequency robust way is hardly feasible well as we know from ivan there are more benign settings non trapping well ivan made this assumption that he called well what i think he called it a a real hammer so this means it's sort of artificial assumption however in our scattering case with a homogeneous object there's a non trapping situation which one could accept as non artificial and this was first identified in that paper by andrea and yuan and they came up with the following remarkable theorem so when you're, you've got a star shaped domain and the interior index of reflection is smaller than the the exterior then you have a stability estimate as it's written here for the scattering problem with some source function f what is remarkable about this stability estimate is that it's extremely explicit what enters is the wave number the index of reflection but what does not enter is the shape of the scatterer the bound is completely independent of the shape of the scatterer as long as the scatterer is star shaped and now this is a rather realistic class of objects you uh, remember that the nanospheres most production processes well rather ensure that what you get will at least be convex so definitely star shaped so in this theorem was the original motivation for this work we we wondered whether we could exploit this shape robustness of the estimate and its explicit nature to understand the frequency dependence of uh, the constants in usual shape uq estimates so now let's look at this non trapping situation in more details let's view it from the perspective of that resolvent operator uh, and mark, it's uh mark, there was a question yes please okay previous page please yeah, so the, here you said that this, uh, there's no information, don't need any information about domain. Assuming this uh, R, PR is a. Uh, uh, PR is a ball of, of some rate. Inside the D, inside the D right? Hmm, excuse me? PR the inside the domain D. The ball yes. is. Okay. So it's in, a some sense, in some sense, it depends on the diameter of the D. Yes, of course, you have this uh, scaling invariance. You see, it's always k times r that enters the bound. Exactly. Yep. So you have scaling invariance in the bound. I should also point out that the bound is more or less behaving linearly in k. So. Okay, thank you. All right, so now, as announced, let's briefly look at it. Uh, from the point of view of this resolvent. What we face here is a more benign situation where the poles do not get close to the real exit. Real axis. At least they will always have some positive distance from it. So this means that, well, you have very mild quasi resonances. Maybe I should go back to this picture. And uh, well, draw the non trapping case, then you would see such a curve. So this is now non trapping. So no peaks, no blow ups, much nicer. And this gave us hope that based on this theorem, one could get fairly strong estimates 
for shape UQ. Now, we have to uh, capture the shape variation in formulas. And here I could simply refer to Laura's presentation. Well, because I'm going to use the same approach of uh, parameterizing the star shaped domain by a radius modulation function. So the domain is just uh, the set of points closer to the origin than one plus one plus r of s. And this r is a scalar valued function on the unit sphere, which gives the radial extension of the scatterer in a particular direction. Through this radial modul modulation function, I'm going to introduce the random perturbation through the usual Karhun and Löwe expansion. Just to remove all randomness in the next step by replacing, as was done in almost all other talks about this same topic before, by replacing the random variables with parameters. So now we have a, a parameterized radius modulation function. R depending on an infinite parameter sequence. Why? I'm, I'm assuming uh, bounded random variables so I can restrict the parameters to the interval minus one to one. What are these RL functions? You could call them, well, the rate, some basis functions for the radius modulation functions. And of course, they come from the Karhun and Löwe expansion. And when we assume rotational invariance, which is a very natural assumption for, say, these nanospheres, then these RLs will just be fully harmonics in 2D, so sine and cosine. And correspondingly, spherical harmonics in 3D. So now we have arrived at a mathematical description of the uh, parameterized problem based on a parameter sequence y. Well, now we have to incorporate this parameterized model into the scattering model. And this is done by the usual approach of domain transformation. So we extend the deformation of the boundary of, of, of the scatterer to the whole space by a radial transformation. So, well, this is the formula. What you do, you just shift all the points lying on a ray uh, by a particular distance. And uh, what we have to assume, of course, is that the radius modulation function is nicely bounded. We bound it by, say, one third. This is an assumption on these uh, coefficients, coefficient sequence beta. And we have to assume that the R function is uh, continuously differentiable. So I've written down all these technical assumptions here, but the gist is that you can find such a formula. You can find such a function uh, high, which features in the formula is a, is a cutoff function. So that phi will provide a by Lipschitz mapping, mapping the unit circle into the boundary of the deformed scatterer. And phi is also the identity mapping outside an annulus while hugging the unit circle. 
This is the key ingredient of the domain transformation approach. This, well, if you or by Lipschitz mapping phi. And then we use it to map the variational formulation of the scattering problem. So instead of looking at the scattered field U, we look at its pullback under phi. And after some computations, one finds that this pullback satisfied, satisfies a modified variational equation with R dependent coefficients. It's written here. So the coefficients, they occur both in the second order and the zero order part. They are labeled with, with hat. Also, the pullback is labeled with a hat. And the concrete formulas for the coefficients are given here. They involve the Jacobi matrices of uh, the transformation mapping and the Jacobi determinants. There's one part in the variational formulation which realizes our exact absorbing boundary conditions. Well, but this part is not important because the outer boundary, the boundary of the BR, which is now a big ball with radius two, is not affected by the shape deformation. So now this is the mapped variational formulation. And now you may have now noticed that I have not written the parameter sequence y on this slide. I've just written the radius modulation function r. And this has a reason. Well, the situation is the following. We have traded the random variables for parameters, but all the influence of the parameters on the problem is channeled through the radius modulation function r. So we can temporarily forget about the parameters and now focus on the dependence of the solution. And now focus on the dependence of the solution of the mapped variational problem on this radius modulation function r. So this u hat is now a function of another function in a function space. And now you may think, hmm, this is a bit awkward. Can we make sense of a smooth dependence on a function? Yes, this is possible uh, because there is a theory of say analyticity or hol holomorphic dependence of functions mapping from one Banach space to another. And this is what I would like to rely on now. So let me make this a bit more explicit. So first, let's look at the coefficients in the mapped variational problem. The hat coefficients. View them as functions of the modulo, uh, the radius modulation function r. And study their, their holomorphic dependence on r. Well, to that end, you have to give formulas. Formulas for the Jacobi determinant and formulas for the Jacobi matrix. This can be done in spherical coordinates, very technical. What is the key observation is that when we bound the radius modulation function by one third, the determinant is bounded from below. 
And the determinant is the only term that occurs in a denominator. All other dependencies on R are, are just a fine linear. So, and this immediately tells us that, well, provided that we have this bound on the radius modulation function, the coefficients are nice, holomorphic, well, enjoy a nice holomorphic dependence on the function R. So, now we have an operator with holomorph, an operator equation with holomorphic coefficients. So, and now I can ap appeal to what I would like to call an analytic implicit function theorem. I'm not giving it in full detail, just an outline. So when you have an holomorphic map from an open subset of a Banach space into the space of invertible linear mappings between two other Banach spaces, all over C. Then on another open set U prime contained in U, the inverse operator will enjoy holomorphic dependence on the parameter. And this is the, the setting we are in. So in order to show the holomorphic dependence of uh, u hat on the radius modulation function, well, we have to show the invertibility or unique solvability of the variational problem. And we do this by establishing k explicit bounds for u hat. And then we can appeal to a Freytalm argument. Moreover, the k explicit bounds are, of course, very useful also for other purposes, as we will see. I'd like to point out that we really have to look at u hat. Because as you may remember from Laura's presentation, the original uh, field solution u as a function of r is not holomorphic. It has these kinks in parameter space. So it's essential to look at u hat. Now, let's apply this, this uh, analytic implicit function theorem. And let's establish the bounds. And of course, what we want to use is the, well, Moyola Spence theory, this remarkable theorem, shape robust. And there's a problem. The problem is not that this is for the untransformed solution U, well, because assuming some bounds on uh, the radius modulation function, we can always relate the norms. The problem is that uh, this theorem is, of course, only proof formulated for domains in space, which correspond to real valued radius modulation function. Once R is complex valued as we need it for shape holomorphy, well, the D of R doesn't make any sense as a domain anymore. How to resolve this? The idea is to, to resort to what I would like to call an imaginary perturbation approach. So what is this? Well, once I heard somebody say that uh, half of mathematics is about adding zero and, and multiplying with one in a creative way. And this is what I'm going to do now. I'm, I'm adding zero in a creative way. I start from the variational problem and now I add a, a, and subtract a variational problem where instead of R, the real part of R enters. So the U hat solution then satisfies this. 
this is an immediate consequence of the variational problem it's supposed to satisfy. But what is crucial is, is that now here on the left, we have a transformed problem associated with a real valued radius modulation function, so a physical domain D. And now here we can undo the transformation. We can go back to you. So, well, then we get this variational problem. And now you see that on the left, it's say the standard variational problem of an untransformed acoustic scattering problem. However, on the right hand side, now we have some modification. And we have some modification involving so these, these differences of coefficients, one for R and the other one for the real part of R. So the hope is that these tilde modified coefficients will become small when the imaginary part of R becomes small. And this hope is justified. Because when you look at these tilde coefficients more closely, you find by struggling with all these explicit formulas that they can really be bounded by the imaginary part of the complex valued radius modulation function. And this paves the way for estimating this modification of the right hand side. For estimating it by the imaginary part of R and of course some constants when we assume that, uh, that both R and its first derivatives are nicely bounded. But this is what we can always assume. So in the end of the day, we can now plug this into the spence moyola theorem and conclude an estimate of this form if a k independent constant, then times k. This stands for a dual norm of the right hand side here. And the imaginary part of R times again the norm of U. And this paves the way for the final estimate. This is what we have. And now, assuming that this imaginary part of R is sufficiently small in the sense that uh, the constant times K times this imaginary part in the C C1 norm is smaller than one half. R of course should also be nicely bounded. Then we can bound the solution and with it the transformed solution by dual norm of the right-hand side times K and the K independent constant. This, to begin with, shows existence of solutions by Fredholm argument and also gives us a bound for certain complex valued R functions. From this theorem, we can immediately extract a domain of holomorphy of the mapping R to U hat of R. It's the set of all continuously differentiable radius modulation functions whose imaginary part times k is smaller than a given constant and they have to be nicely bounded. The constants do not depend on, on k. And now we see that here k really is what Ivan called a bad parameter because as k gets big, we see that this force is tighter and tighter bound on the imaginary part of R. So it becomes a more and more narrow region, well, along, say, the real line in the C1 space of complex valued functions. And this bad dependence on K cannot be dropped. 
There's a very recent paper by Ewan Spence and Jared Wunsch that gives examples that show that such estimates are, are really sharp. So let's put up with it. And now go back to the uh, parameterization through Karun and Löwe. Now, we have this domain of analyticity of u hat as a function of r. We have the formula, this uh, linear dependence of r on the y parameters. And so we immediately get a domain of analyticity now in the y parameters. Here I call it hk. It's just the estimates that we had for a translated through the Karhun and Löwe expansion. And there's not much to be discussed. I would like, just like to just point out that also here we have this bound on the imaginary part of the complex valued parameters. And the bound is of order one over k. So, well, summarizing, you had as a function of the parameter sequence is holomorphic and bounded on this, say, infinite dimensional complex domain. And now we can apply a very powerful theory. Well, I would like the Cohen Schwab theory for the approximation of uh, functions of infinitely many, holomorphic functions of infinitely many parameters by polynomials. Key is the concept of a Bernstein ellipse and their infinite products called poly ellipse. Remember the Bernstein ellipse is uh, described by a parameter rho, which is related to its width. And crudely speaking, rho minus one, rho is uh, larger than one, rho minus one, it gives the width or the, the, the height of this ellipse. Forming the algebraic product of these ellipses gives us poly ellipse. And holomorphy of u hat of y on such poly ellipse is a key ingredient for applying the general estimates. Well, but now we can reap the fruits of our efforts to establish the domain of analyticity because, well, we can now say if the parameters of row parameters here given by us, a parameter sequence row L of the poly ellipse satisfies this estimate, then the resulting, well, y sequence will be in HK and indirectly the R function in this E row. Uh, and, and then the R function in its domain of holomorphy. And we also have on this polyellipse nice bounds proportional to K of this type. And now this makes possible to apply the abstract estimates of a theory that uh, Cohen and Schwab called uh, BP epsilon holomorphy theory. So it tells us when you have such an estimate for the parameters of the polyllips, you have nice bounds, holomorphy. Then Whenever you have a, say, a linear and bounded output functional, and the beta sequence times the C1 norms of this, uh, well, basis functions for, for R belongs to some LP space for P uh, smaller than one, P between one and zero, then you can estimate the error or the best error of an endpoint well sparse tensor smolyak type quadrature formula this formula with an algebraic rate in the number of quadrature points quadrature point series amounts to sampling points well 
that depends on the parameter p. So this is a very powerful abstract theory. <laughs> the drawback here is that this has so far defined a frequency explicit treatment. There's a constant depending on k that will blow up as k grows. And it's not clear what it, its exact dependence on k is like. There's one special case where we can say something. And this special case is the case where the, the beta sequence that characterizes the shape perturbation is, pro well, its norm is proportional to one over k. So this means that the shape perturbation, the size of the shape perturbation is proportional to the intrinsic wavelength. Remember the wavelength is uh, the other, say physical length contained in the scattering problem. So when you shrink the shape, the size of the shape perturbation proportional to the wavelength, then it's possible to show that this constants will just be proportional to k. But of course, this is not really desirable because when you think of a nanoparticle, then uh, when it's manufactured, uh, well, you may have a clue for which purpose it's used, but you may not know what will be the wavelength of the light scattered at it. It could also be x-rays. And so uh, linking the shape perturbation to the wavelength is a bit problematic for from the practical point of view. But so far, we could not get rid of it and uh, come up with a frequency explicit estimate independent of this as this somehow annoying assumption. And that's all I wanted to tell you. This is the end of my presentation and I would like to thank you for your attention.